Hi, folks. Thanks for joining us again, Faith Community Church Online, for I think week five or six, something like that. We're ready to get back together with you folks in church and worship together properly. But for now, we'll do what we can. Uh, why don't you join with us and sing? We're going to sing Death Was Arrested.
Good morning, and welcome to Faith Community Church. My name is Russ Diedrichsen, and I am this week's lay leader. I want to start off by thanking everyone who prayed for my daughter, Sadie. A couple of weeks ago, we had a little bit of an accident, and the prayers were greatly appreciated. It is that accident and the way she reacted along with my reaction and and how everything happened that I I would kind of like to base my uh, story off of this morning. So I need to fill you in a little bit. <clears throat> the Saturday before Easter, Avery was helping her mom, Allison, uh, make dessert for the Easter dinner. And she was up on a stool, crushing crackers and putting them into a mixing bowl. And um, she slipped on the chair and fell off. And when she fell to the floor, she knocked the bowl off and it came down as well. And it landed on her hand and it broke her ring finger right here, and then it it severed her pinky finger across this joint right below the fingernail. And it was still hanging by the skin on the side, and luckily a couple of the arteries were still intact. Um, I got a phone call from Alice, and I was out at the farm, and she told me that I could tell it wasn't good, and she told me that Sadie was fine, but she had cut her finger and they were on their way to the hospital. Uh, I could hear in her voice that things weren't fine, but uh, but I knew I needed to get there. Um, so I took off from the farm and uh, drove quickly uh, into the hospital. Allison had picked up Sadie and using a, a kitchen towel, she'd wrapped the hand up so that Sadie couldn't see it. And they got into the vehicle and my other daughter, Avery, drove them to the emergency room. Um, the ride to Creighton for those guys was pretty tough. Uh, Sadie was crying um, hard. Allison was probably crying a little bit harder than that. And Avery was actually the one that was crying the hardest, I I truly believe. Um, But it's the way Avery, or excuse me, the way Sadie reacted uh, that I want to talk about. Um, She's four and a half years old, and she's told us that because it was her half birthday the other day. And she... uh, on the way to town, as she's crying and she's holding her hand and, and in, in a considerable amount of pain, um, is when Sadie herself started praying. And she asked God to heal her hand. Will you please help heal my hand? Will you help make my fingers better? Um, and she prayed on the way to the hospital. Now, I have to imagine that God's smile on his face when he heard that prayer. And I truly believe that God said, little one, I have you here. Um, I'm with you. We're going to heal you up. You're going to be okay. And then I have to sit there and think about the way I prayed on the way to town. My prayer was, God, please fix this thing, uh, fix this hand. And I was, I, was, I was more begging and demanding than I was faithful and, uh, and just talking to the Lord. Um, I get to the hospital and I go in and, and only Allison could be in there. And then she was, came out and I was able to go in and see her for a little bit. And when I went in to see her, of course, we, she cried for a little bit. And but then she was sitting there with one nurse on each side of her holding the hand. One was holding the, the one hand and then the other one was holding her good hand. And, um, Sadie started talking and she goes, dad, my hand's already getting healed. God's healing it right now. And both nurses looked at me and I, I said, yeah, I, I know, sweetheart. I think, I think he is too. I know that. And she goes, I have so much God in my heart that I just know I'm going to be okay. Um, the faith of a child is like no other. And it really humbled me to have her say that and have her tell me that in the middle of a pretty traumatic situation, a very tough situation for a four-year-old little girl. And I think about now how I prayed and how I reacted to that difficult situation and the anxiety and the stress and the anger and um, the worry that I had compared to her. Um, In Luke 17, verse 18, it says, Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Uh, I have some work to do. Um, we're in some very difficult times and 
we're unprecedented in the things that we face on a daily basis. Uh, our lives are all changed right now uh, with this coronavirus and it can be very stressful and things that we don't even realize are stressing us out are stressing us. And there can be financial strain, there can be um, uh, separation anxiety, there can be a number of different things that, very, that can be very difficult for us to face. And as I looked at this, the way my four-year-old daughter reacted to having a very bad injury and, and having all the faith in God that there possibly could be, um, that I keep thinking to myself, why don't I turn to God more often when we get into difficult situations? Um, I was reading the Bible and I was reading Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts, your minds, in Jesus Christ. That's something that I, I need to work on. I think a, a lot of people that I know, you know, hopefully can work on. And um, I just, uh, I challenge everyone this week. Um, with that being said, uh, my daughter is healing up. They reattached the finger. Um, it is still alive, which we are very happy about that. We still have a little issue with the growth plate. We're hoping that that heals correctly as it was broken. And, uh, but we'll know a lot more in the next uh, couple of months with that. So I thank you for the prayers and I wish that uh, everybody has a great week. If we could close in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we just thank you for the many blessings you give us during these trying times. The time that we get to spend with family, Lord, that maybe we wouldn't have got to before. Uh, maybe it will help us slow down and focus on you a little bit more, Lord, as we all need to. We thank you for the week, the weather that you provided us. We ask that you keep all the farmers safe as they're out in the fields. And we ask that the faith and love can enter our hearts more now than ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. Today we're going to sing some kids' song, and most of them will be about Easter because we missed out in Sunday school in Awana, but you know them all. We're going to start with Hallelujah, Christ is Risen. The girls can sing Hallelujah, and the boys will sing Christ is Risen. Here we go. Hallelujah, Christ is Risen. Okay? 
Did you blow up the microwave again? Of course not. What do you mean, again? Well, remember that time you put the Arby's wrapper in the microwave and the whole thing started smoking? And now, that then there were sparks in, and then... Yeah, I remember, but that's the forgotten past. <laughs> the past it may be, but it's certainly not forgotten. Well, it should be forgotten. That happened back when I was little. Joe, it happened last week. Well, um, anyway, it's not the microwave. The toilet flooded? No. Uh, the dog got out? No. Well, then what's the problem? You see, every time I talk, try to talk to my younger sister, mean words fly out of my mouth. You mean you speak unkindly to her? Well, you could put it that way, but I prefer to think of it as words flying out of my mouth. That way, I'm not responsible. I can't control it. What? You're right about one thing, though words are hard to control, but in the Bible, James says no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Deadly poison? I didn't realize it was that bad. That's horrible. But the verse said that no one can tame the tongue. It's hopeless. I'm ruined. No, no, not completely ruined, Joe. You've forgotten that in Philippians it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's true, without God we're hopeless. But with Jesus on our side, we can claim victory even over our tongues. So, how do I go about claiming this victory? Well, I can think of two things to do. Yeah? First... Ask God to guard your mouth. Psalm 141.3 says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. Will asking God to guard my mouth really help? I think so. Proverbs also says that he who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. But don't forget that we can't guard our mouths on our own. We must ask God to let the words of our mouth be acceptable in his sight. Okay, I can do that. What's the second thing? Well, I think we should practice. So here's what we'll do. I'll pretend to be your little sister, and I'm going to be in your room. When you come in, you have to say something. If you say something godly, the kids will cheer for you. And if I say mean things? Then the kids will boo. Okay, let's try it. All right. Okay, kids, are you ready? Cheer if Joe says something nice, but boo if he says something mean. You little hoodlum, this is my room, you hear? You better get out of here before I count to five. Boo! Who else? Joe, let's try that again. No name calling this time. No name calling? I'll try. What are you doing in my room? It's mine! Boo! Yeah, right now! Boo! Hmm. Well, Joe, instead of ordering around, try to say kind words. Kind? Hmm. That's new. I'll try it. Alright, go try. 
Please get out of my room! Boo. Well, the words were okay, Joe, but now try saying it pleasantly. Pleasantly? Wait, I have an idea. Talk to her the way you would like to be talked to. Oh, you mean that golden rule. Do unto others as you'd have others do to you. That's right, but it's not just a rule. Jesus said it. Jesus? You mean Jesus wants me to talk to my sister kindly too? You bet he does. You remember that verse in James I told you about? Uh-huh. Well, the next verse says that with our tongues we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. What is that supposed to mean? It means that everybody was created in the likeness of God, and when we speak cruelly to them, it's like we're talking like that to God. Jesus says that whatever we do to the least of them, we're doing to Him. That's pretty serious. I think so, too. Okay, I think I'm ready, ready now. All right, let's go. Becky, what are you doing in here? Don't you remember I like to have my room all to myself? How about coming out and playing cards with me instead? Yay! Joe, you did it. That was awesome. You really think so? I really do. See, that wasn't so hard, was it? No, once I tried to speak to her the way I'd like to be spoken, it was easy as pie. Mm-hmm. Uh-oh. What? Um... Joe? Well, I, I'd forgotten... Forgotten what? Well, I was heating up a piece of pie in the microwave. I don't like the sound of this. Well, I forgot the pie pan was aluminum, and well, you know, aluminum is sort of um, a metal, and well, our microwave's sort of acting funny. Oh no, Joe, not the new microwave. Yeah, you want to come help me fix it? No, not really. You said do unto others as you'd have... Okay, uh, okay, you're right. Let's go fix the microwave. Well, that's a great little skit. Uh, this teaches the, the, the importance of partnering with God. Uh, in the process of working out things in our life that dishonor him and dishonor other people and seeing how practically we can do that. Uh, it's, it's cool to see things in, a, in, in that kind of format as a skit. And uh, this next song we're going to sing is a song that is somewhat familiar to uh, most of you. We've sung it a few, talk, a few times in church. It's called Behold, uh, Then Sings My Soul. And it's a song that describes how the triune God, both Father, Son, and Spirit, is with us through every aspect and process in our life with Him. And then when He starts, he, fin he walks with us, and He finishes, and He will bring to completion. And I think it's just a, a, an amazing picture um, of who He is and what He's doing for us and something that we should focus in on. And so I'd like to invite you to sing with us. If you don't know the song, uh, just focus in on the words. Here we go.
our praise is Faith Community Church TV mini-series volume. I have no idea how long we've been doing this, but <laughs> I'm ready for it to be over. Uh, it's not really the most enjoyable thing to preach to an empty room and to an iPhone, uh, but happy to do this because this is, this is what we got, and I'm really grateful for the ability to do this um, and come to you in this way, and really I'm grateful for just the, the various comments that I've heard from each, each one of you and um, just seeing how the Lord is using this in your life. And I just, just love the church we're a part of. And it's just great to see the body of Christ do uh, what it's doing. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever had this experience, but it's something that I learned uh, somewhere, I guess, younger in life. It's just, a, it's just an interesting thing that happens when you work really, really hard for something uh, and then you're finally... Uh, up against actually being able to do it. There's this weird thing that happens in your body where, and maybe this is just me, I don't know, but there's this weird thing that happens in your body where you're super excited to do it, but yet you're really anxious about it too. And there's just this kind of weird pull inside you where, you're, where, you're, where your heart's dropping down, but you're, but you're leaping at the same time. And you're just, you know, you're really excited and anticipating what you're going to do, but, but you're kind of scared at the same time. I'm not exactly sure how it's all going to work out. Uh, the first time I noticed this was probably when I was in sixth grade. Uh, I had a, was playing on a rec basketball league, and we, we were in the championship. I mean, we'd played all our short lives to get to this point. And um, right before the game, I just remember that just there was just this weird feeling of I'm, I'm ready to go, but I'm, I'm, I'm scared that we might mess up, we might lose this, and we might miss out on our chance to hold up that trophy at the end of the game. Um, we did win the game and won the trophy and, you know, went down in the record books as a sixth grader, however old I was, I don't know. Um, but I saw that that same kind of feeling that came throughout life, a movement, graduating graduating middle school, going into high school, that just first day of high school, I'm finally in the big leagues here, but I'm a really small man on campus, and graduating high school, going to college, being off on my own for the first time, uh, my parents drove away, just this excitement, but still not exactly sure what's, what's going to happen. I remember the first time I preached, well, this was very much like this, I was going up to the pulpit, I'm just like sitting here as a young college student, and I'm not sure... What in the world this pastor decided to let me preach, take the pulpit of this church that I did not expect myself to be able to speak in front of that many people. Um, but I'm going up this pulpit just going, uh, the Holy Spirit is real. 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 And then stepping into what I had been preparing for for a long time and finally being able to put together and craft a message and share biblical truth in a way that was helpful for people uh, so that they would be able to take that home with them. And I'm sure many of you have felt this way before. Uh, any of you who is a doctor and the first time you've uh, ever took your, your first patient or a lawyer working so hard in their life uh, to finally take their face, first case, um, a construction worker building their first house, uh, you know, it's just this, this, this anticipation that is, that is happening, um, and it's kind of normal for life, and it's happened throughout history. And in fact, this passage that we're looking at today, I believe the Israelites are feeling the same kind of anticipation. Uh, today we're going to be in Joshua chapter 2. We're continuing the series that we've been in for a while, and I'm really grateful to Paul for this message he had last week on Rahab. Uh, discussing. I, I mean, I loved how he put it at the end. He said, I think he said, every sinner has a past and every saint has a future. And just the beautiful story of grace that we see in Rahab where 
Uh, God takes a woman who was far from God, who saw the works of God, who wanted to align herself with God, and God rescued her and her family and turned her into a main character in his story. And what that illustrates is that no matter where we are, no matter how young we are, old we are, how far we've gone, we've fallen, how dark our past is, how broken our lives is, God can take the broken pieces of our life and fashion together in a beautiful mosaic, declaring his grace and his glory in us in a beautiful way to shift us and to move us into the future with a purpose. Now we're continuing that story and we're picking it up in chapter 3. And chapter 3 is really a, a new shift in the story. It's 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 the movement and a description of Israel crossing the Jordan. And really that story continues through both chapter 3 and chapter 4. But today we're just going to look at chapter 3. And in this chapter we're going to see a few things as we look through the story. And then hopefully we're going to come home with something uh, that we can, we can take with us through this week. Even if we're not able to go out uh, and to visit people. I think this passage has a lot to say uh, for our lives as believers. I mean, it has, it has a lot to say for our lives as believers. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, if you're here with us, um, I want you to invite, to invite you to pick it up. Turn to Joshua chapter 3, and we're going to start in the beginning. In those first six verses, I want you to notice that God's uh, people, they prepare themselves before he moves mightily. God's people prepare themselves before he moves mightily. Uh, now, the first verse here in chapter 3, verse 1, it says that Joshua, then Joshua rose early in the morning and set out from Shittim. Now, what's amazing here is we, we get a picture and a glimpse of, uh, of the reason why Joshua is the right man for the job here. Uh, Joshua is a man of action. Uh, he is a leader that just takes things and moves with it. He's not sitting on his laurels. Uh, or resting on his Lord is probably the better way to say that, or sitting on his hands. He, he's, he's not waiting around. He's, he's taking information and he's moving out with a purpose. You see, just if you'll look up in your Bibles, just right above that verse is chapter 2, verse 24, which the spies come to Joshua and say, Truly, the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. Joshua had sent those guys out to get some, a certain information, to get a feeling and a pulse on what was going on in the land of these people. And he got back a good report. They are terrified. They are, they are just terrified of him. So Joshua's like, all right, it's time to go. God said it. Scouts confirmed it. We are getting out of here. So he, he gathers all the people. And right now there's about 2 million uh, Israelites, somewhere around 2 million Israelites coming up. From Shittim, which is in the plains of Moab, uh, opposite of Jericho, essentially, uh, coming down into the Rift Valley, that where the river of uh, the Jordan River comes down, um, and they're they're going and they're camping right on the shores of the Jordan River. Um, and it says they came to Jordan. He and all the people of Israel lodged there before they passed over. Now. What we find out later in this chapter is that this right now, this time that they come down, the Jordan, the Jordan River is in its flood stage. So in harvest time, when it starts getting a little warmer, it, mostly in the north in, in Mount Hermon, where the headwaters of the Jordan come from, the, the snowpack up there starts melting and it comes down and it starts flooding the Sea of Galilee and flooding the, the Jordan River. So the, there's five headwaters that come up from above the Sea of Galilee. All that water funnels, funnels into the Sea of Galilee, and then, it, and then it comes down that Jordan Rift Valley down into the Dead Sea and, and dumps out. And, and right now, if you go there in Israel, you're probably not going to see a whole lot of raging water at that time. Uh, but then that, ri that river could have gotten kind of quite big at certain times in the year. It was never really a massive river. Uh, but it would get quite big at, during flood stage. Uh, I would probably liken it to the Niobrara River right north of us. You know, it's not really that big of a river, but during flood stage, it can have some serious power. And anyone here in Holt County learned that last year uh, when that river uh, broke open the dam, tore the, just 
took the road away, just gone. I mean, I was there afterwards, just kind of saw that damage. It's just amazing. Um, so this river right now is kind of at flood stage, and it's not really a place that you want to pass at right now at this point. And the people of God are sitting there waiting for God to do something, and Joshua starts to begin to prepare the people for this mighty act of God. Um, it says this in verse 2, At the end of the three days, of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people. It says, As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. All right? So here's the orders. You're going to see the Ark of God go out from your place. And as you see it go out, you're going to follow it because you're going to follow after what God is doing. Now, the ark here is, one of, is, a, is, is a main character almost in this passage. It's not mentioned, this is the first time it's mentioned in the book. Uh, and in this, just this one chapter, it's mentioned over 10 times. Um, and if you're an astute Bible student, anytime you see something mentioned over and over and over again, it's something you want to catch your eye to. And if you'll remember, the ark, it's, it's like a chest uh, that God had given specific design instructions for. Uh, it's got some cherubs on top of it, and there's only a certain group of people who are allowed to carry it. It was designed to sit and reside in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and represent God's seat with the people. Um, and it, it, is, it is representative, representative of God's presence walking with the people. Now that the pillar of uh, fire and of cloud, and, uh, cloud was not with them anymore. That this new ark was representing of God being with his people. And so Joshua instructed the leaders and the leaders instructed the people. says, look, the, once you see that ark go, that's what you're going to follow. But before you do that, I need to prepare you uh, a little bit in a couple of things. One, in how you're going to react and inter interact with this, uh, this ark that's going to go. Um, and he says this. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you shall not have passed this way before. You see, this served a couple purposes for the people. Joshua wanted the people 2,000 cubits away. Now, a cubit is roughly around 18 inches, 18 to 20 inches, depending on what a uh, commentator you're reading or, or Bible dictionary you have. But really, it's, it was just a measurement between the, your elbow uh, and, and uh, either the top of your, of your hand or the bottom of your, um, of your hand right here. Um, we're not completely sure, but it's basically the length of a forearm. And that cubit was a, was a length of measurement, kind of like we would say a foot, uh, but just helped them measure things. So you're about roughly 18 inches or so, um, most of you are now doing home uh, homeschool, so you're kind of getting the math here. But you take 18 inches, you multiply it by 2,000, you divide that by 12, you get 3,000 feet. So 3,000 feet, these people are supposed to be away uh, from from this ark. That's about half, a little over half a mile. That. Joshua instructed the people to be away from the ark as it went out. And that did a couple things for the people. One, it illustrated the reality that God deserved honor and respect and reverence. That God's people needed to revere who he is in their life. Look, this... God, the, the Lord their God, the God of heavens, of the heavens and the earth who created everything, is not some God who they're supposed to carry with them as some kind of lucky trinket to get them what they wanted. God was to be understood as, as he was and looked at and thought of as he was. As, as the one who spoke and everything came into existence. As the one who created the ground that they're standing on. As the one who rescued them out of their bondage in Egypt. As the one who carried them through the wilderness for 40 years. Pro provided food for them every single day. Who kept their clothes from wearing out. The one who created their body. Who deserves everything, every ounce of worship that they have. 
And he's to be set apart and revered in, in a very specific way. Not approached flippantly, but in awe and reverence before an almighty God who's walking amongst their midst. But the second purpose that this served as is that, I don't know if, about you, but anytime I'm in a crowd of people and someone wants to come show, show this crowd I'm in something, it's extremely hard for me to see what that thing is if it's brought close and I'm in the back. If someone says, hey, come, come look at this video on my phone and there's a crowd of people, I'm, you know, you're standing there, you kind of want to, want to look and see and say, hey, what's, you know, I'd like to, excuse me, can I, can I just see that after you're done showing those people? There's just, it's just difficult to see exactly what's there. But it gets a little bit easier to see if that image or that object is a little bit further away and a little bit higher up in elevation. This is why we, we have a stage in our, in our multi-purpose room, sanctuary, whatever you want to call it. Where we have all the chairs on the ground and we have the stage up far, a little bit further away, a little bit higher up so people can see what's on there. And what Joshua is saying is here, you, you guys got to know where this is going because you don't, you don't know where you've been before. We're going to a brand new place and you need to watch. You need to be able to see the ark go. You need to be able to see God move in front of you. Now, if you think about that, that's about a half mile and we're coming into the Jordan River Valley, which is slowly lo lowers in elevation as it gets down to the Dead Sea. And so these people, that are the, the priests are carrying the ark North of the people, about a half mile, and the people are down a little bit. That's very well could allow every single one of those two million people to see the Ark of the Covenant go by. And what that illustrates is that God wants his people not to blindly follow the rest of the people around them, but he wants every individual person in his congregation to be able to look out and to see where he is going and what he is doing and to see who he is. He wants his people individually to be able to see God as he is and where he is going and follow him along with the congregation. And so Joshua is instructing the people to say, look, you've got to be able to see God here. And not only that, but you've got to prepare yourselves. It says this, verse 5, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will will do wonders among you. And then Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark and they went before the people. Joshua's initiating it. It's time to go. We're, we're moving. He's going. But listen, people, you've got to consecrate yourself before the Lord because he is about to do a mighty, he's about to do wonders among you. See, here's the principle we're getting here is that God's people prepare themselves before he moves in a mighty way. And this is something that's consistent. Uh, it doesn't always work this way. God is able to do whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it, however he wants to do it. And he's worked in differing ways in life, uh, in, in scripture and in life. But one way he has worked is when his people prepare themselves before him. It allows him to work in a specific way on behalf of them. You see, this word consecrate, it's, it comes from the word, uh, we also get the word make to, to sanctify. Some of your Bibles might be use that, use that translation. And what that word really means, literally means, comes from the root of word to cut or to cut off. And what that really means is just to make separate, to separate yourself. And what it meant for the people of Israel is to separate from the world that is around you and to, and to, and to purify yourself in the way in which God had, had, had declared and designed them to do. The way in which God had instructed them through Moses to, to prepare themselves for him. To humble themselves before God and, and await for him to do a mighty miracle on their behalf. And you see, we see this not just here in Joshua, but uh, many people, even now, uh, we've, this is almost a tagline going around right now. Uh, Second Chronicles 7.14. For if, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek 
my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. If my people will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, will consecrate themselves before me, then I will, I will relent this disaster and I will heal their land. I will forgive them and I will heal their land. See, James picks this up too in James 4. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to James 4. Um, I didn't bookmark it, so I can give you some time uh, to turn there. Uh, instead of having to pause the video to get there and turn it back up. Um, but James picks this up too. And well, actually on a side note, I, I don't know if you knew this, but God has been trying to give us instructions for how to deal with pandemics since the first century. Uh, if we would have just listened to this, we probably would have been in better shape than we are right now. But listen, seriously, what? You're not going to believe this. Uh, it says this right here, verse chapter four, verse eight. It says, it says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Well, that would have worked a lot better if there were people here laughing. But uh, now, just all the joking, all joking aside, uh, James here is, is talking in a discussion at the end of his book about the, the difference between wisdom from above and, and worldly wisdom and an alliance with worldly things. And... and what he's, what he's doing here is he's, he's describing how, why the, the believers that he's writing to are not receiving the blessing uh, that God has promised them. He says this, he says, what causes, causes quarrels in your, and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask, and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Right, so these people were, were, were aligning themselves with a worldly thinking, which is a me first type of thinking. We've said this before. Sin is defined as a life turned inward, and the world perpetuates this understanding that life is about me. It's about get, get, get mine before anyone else. And that is not what the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is following the Lord and loving my neighbor as myself. Loving the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving my neighbor as myself, not elevating myself above the Lord or elevating myself above my neighbor, but keeping myself in a right position before an almighty God and a person who's created in his image. And so James goes on and he says, he says this, Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he'll exalt you. And you see, you hear the echo of not only what is happening in Joshua chapter 3, but what happened in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And it's this idea that if God's people will just simply humble themselves, purify them, prepare themselves for him. It allows God to do a mighty work. Because further on in, the, in James, at the end of the chapter, he starts making a discussion about if you just pray for these things with the right heart posture, then God's going to work on, on mightily on your behalf. And he references Elijah. He says, Elijah, just like a normal man with the same kind of, um, the same kind of, of nature as us. Yet he prayed and God stopped the rain for three years. And then he prayed again and it rained again. And, it, and essentially, we all have that opportunity. We just simply need to prepare ourselves before the Lord and ask in a right manner, not for our own passions, but for God's kingdom and his purpose is here on earth. And so Joshua is taking that same concept and he's calling the people, prepare yourself for the work of God. Then he goes on, chapter, verse 3, chapter 7. And he gives instructions uh, and comes up with this, with this concept that confidence um, in confidence in future battles comes 
uh, from previous miracles. Our confidence in future bat battles is sourced in previous miracles or miraculous works of God. So look at this. Uh, Lord says to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, as for you command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant. And when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Now listen to this. I, I want you to notice this, and this is just a side comment about this leader here, is that God is not... Uh, is not highlighting jo Joshua's, uh, his skill and his qualifications as a leader. But rather, God is highlighting the fact that he is the one who is establishing Joshua. Look at this. He says, today I, God, will begin to exalt you, Joshua, in the sight of all of Israel. That they may know that as I, God, was with Moses, and all the things that Moses did was because I was with him, it was not Moses, so I will be with you. And as far as, uh, as, far as you, command the priest. So God is the one who's establishing Joshua, reiterating the promise in the first chapter of this book. And then Joshua takes that, which is this, this amazing thing. He just takes it and he, and he runs with it. Verse 9, and Joshua says to the people, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, here's how you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Now Joshua, what you want to notice here is just a couple of things. Joshua, he's, he's not... He's confident in what God has said about him. And this is a mark of a, of a true leader. A true leader doesn't have to sit here and claim his leadership to the people. You see, God just, God just talked to him and said, Joshua, the time is now that I'm going to exalt you. I'm, I'm going to do a work and exalt you in front of the people. And Joshua turns and says, look, guys, God is about to give you a sign so that you know the living God is with you and that he's going to drive out these people in this land. Joshua doesn't go, hey, guys, listen, listen over here. God is about to exalt me as leader, so you've got to pay attention. He doesn't go and say, you know, hey, 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 I'm, uh, excuse me, I'm the leader over here. God said so. I'm the, I'm the leader. You got to listen. I'm, hey, no. I, not you. I'm the leader. God, you gotta, you gotta listen to me. I'm, I'm the leader. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the one in charge. No, he doesn't do that. Why? Because God's leaders, they don't, you don't need to, to fight for your leadership if, if God is the one who's establishing you. God establishes Joshua, and Joshua proves the fact that he is the right man for the job because. He is this humble man who's not in it for himself. He's in it for the things of God. And he takes this message and turns it into something that's not the exaltation of Joshua, but rather the exaltation of God and the encouragement of his people. And so he says, the living God, which is in contrast to the dead gods of these people that they're about to interact with. Look, you can't mix this up. They're about to cross the Jordan and the crossing of the Jordan into the land of promise flowing with milk and honey is not a picture of a heavenly paradise. It is a movement from out of the dead of the wilderness into the battle and the fight for the promise. And there are, 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 there are nations that are entrenched throughout the land. That they are called to walk faithfully with God to destroy and dispose of them out of that land. And there's a fear and a terror that's there, an anticipation. We're about to go and do this, but am I able to actually get this done? Am I, am I able to be able to do this? And Joshua's saying, look, yes, you are going to be able to do this. Why? Not because you're able to, but because God is with you. And you're going to know that this living God is with you, and he's going to dispose these people out in front of you in front of you 
Verse 11, it says, Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, and when the soles of the feet of the priests bear the, bearing the ark of the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand up in one heap. And what Joshua is trying to explain here is that God is about to do a miraculous thing, just like he did with Moses back in Sinai. And what he's doing right now is not only giving you passage in, but confirming to you that no matter what you face, God is going to be with you. No matter what you face, God is going to be with you. And you can take confidence in any future battle that you have because of this miraculous event that is about to happen before you. See, confidence comes, confidence for future battles is sourced in not only the character and nature of God, but what he's done for us in the past. And then the text moves on and, and the action happens. The promise is fulfilled. And what God is doing in this fulfilling of the promise is preparing his people to live a life of faith devoid of human effort. It's a living a life not based on what they are, they are able to do, but based on the fact that God is with them. A life of faith and obedience before God. Look at this. It says, so when the people set out from their tents, this is verse 14, uh, to pass over the Jordan, the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the ark, were dipped in the brink of the water. Now the Jordan overflows its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above, listen to this, stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam. The city is by, beside Zarathon. This is about 16 miles north of where the, the ark of the covenant is sitting. And they were completely cut off. And so the people passed over. And the priests stayed there on dry ground until two million people came by. And God worked this miraculous thing. Two million people just crossed a dry riverbed. Okay, so apparently my iPhone decided to stop at this point. So we're just going to do a little video magic, put these things together, start back up, and uh, just... Trust that the God who's able to bring two million people through uh, the Jordan River Valley on dry ground is able to make this iPhone work and get this technology to do what it needs to do. So, um, but it's just amazing here what's happening in the story. God's preparing his people for a life of faith before him, of faithful obedience before him. Looking at him, giving the model to say that, look, here's how life's going to work in the promised land. If it's going to be successful for you and you're going to receive the blessing. You're going to look at me. You're going to wait for me to act. And I will step forward and I will work on your behalf. And then you're going to follow after what I've asked you to do. And so these people go through and they're, they're, they're coming through. They're they are stepping on this new land. And in stepping on this new land, they are, they're committing themselves to a way of life. I mean, I love how Don Campbell puts this. It says, he says this, For Israel crossing the Jordan meant they were irrevocably committed to a struggle against armies, chariots, and fortified cities. They were also committed to walk, to walk by faith in the living God and to turn from a walking according to the flesh as they had done in the wilderness. See, that's the reality. These people were, were committing to a life of faith in struggle against opposing armies, people groups, nations who were trenched in in their little pieces of property, who did not want to give up those pieces of property, who were going to give them a fight, who were completely opposed to the things of God. And God was bringing his people and preparing them and giving them a model for life of blessing in the new world. Land of promise. And I think that this passage so clearly illustrates the Christian life. Like, I don't know about you, but most times I've heard this passage preached on, it's usually it's focused in around the feet of those priests that were in the water in the, in the Jordan. 
And usually what happens is some, some kind of principle is pulled out of that to say that God sometimes wants you uh, because God didn't, that God, God separated the waters in the Red Sea without them having to do that. But here he's, he's separating it with them stepping into the water first. And so therefore uh, God wants you to sometimes step out into faith, uh, into the unknown, take a step of faith before uh, he's going to provide the miracle for your life. And you know, that, that's very true in a lot of areas. I've actually seen that happen in a lot of ways in my life. There's been a lot of times where provision was needed and the Lord just wanted me to step out into faith. Uh, and he just provided miraculously. Either that was what was happening or he just said, you know what, this kid is going to just die if I don't do something because he's not paying attention to what I'm asking him to do and I've just got to catch up for him. But uh, but no, God, God has come through in ways where, where I, you take a step of faith and, and God comes through. But I don't think that necessarily that this is what this passage is, is dealing with. I think that this passage is talking about something a little bit more deeper than that. I think that this passage, that God has written this, his story in such a way, he's commanded his people to move and to act in such a way to foreshadow and to allude to what Jesus was going to do on the cross. Now, this kind of blew me away when I was looking at this. I'd, I'd never seen this before, but this passage here in verse, chap, chap, verse, chapter 3, verse 16, it says that the water went up and it rose up and it stopped at Adam. And it stopped at Adam. Um, and that town, Adam, this is, little, this is the only time in, this, in the entire book of the Bible that that town is actually mentioned. I mean, scholars think they know where it's at, but not completely sure. They think it's about 16 miles north of Jericho on the opposite side of, of the Jordan River. Uh, but I think it's really interesting here when it just says the word Adam, this town, and how God had the water stop at Adam. And what we see is that it's not until this ark, which is the representation of the presence of God with the people of God, gets into the water. As soon as it gets into the water, it, it experiences the water that Jordan. That water gets stopped up in Adam. And immediately your mind should, should turn to think towards Romans 5, where death, sin and death came in through one man and life and grace came in through another. Through Jesus. That Jesus came and he took upon himself our sin and our, and, our, and, our, uh, and our brokenness. And he tasted death for us. You see, sin came into the world through Adam. And death through sin. And the curse that has affected every single one of us who have been born on this earth. Every single one of us was sourced in him, flowing out of his lineage. And just this. God uses this to showcase how Christ is going to step into the middle of that river of, of sin and death coming out towards us and that judgment that's coming and stop it up for his people to allow them to come across on dry ground into the land of promise. In the same way, Jesus tasted death for us so that its sting would not hurt us anymore. He took upon our sin so it no longer was a burden for us anymore. He took, he took the death that we deserve and gave us the life that he deserves. And I think that this is what this passage is revealing and pointing towards. And I think seeing it this way, you start seeing this conquest of the land of promise as a clear picture of what the, of what the life of a Christian looks like. There's no doubt that our lives are not perfect when we come to know the Lord. There is a peace that, that, is, that is different. There is a life that is different. There is an experience that you know when Jesus comes in and invades your life and changes you from the inside out that you're not the same person anymore. 
But God has not designed our lives to be perfect once that happens. Rather, he's allowed sin, our flesh, to stay with us. It's a flesh that is waging war against the spirit that is, that is his spirit that is in us. And there is this battle where in which God desires to walk with each of us through life, slowly taking out the Canaanites and the, and the Gergesites and the Jebusites and the Hivites and the Hittites of our lives and seeing them break down before us. And I think what those represent is sin, strongholds of sin in our life, dispositions, patterns of life, ways of thinking that God wants to, wants to take out. And he's giving us an illustration of how that actually happens. Look, if you've got an anger problem, it doesn't happen by just trying to think about, I'm not going to be angry today, I'm not going to be angry today, I'm just going to do my best not to be angry today, I'm going to meditate a little bit, I'm going to be, you know, I'm just... Just going to stop, stop, stop. And then all of a sudden, you get put on quarantine, and all of your 16 kids are back in the house, and you know, you're, now you're supposed to be the teacher, except you, fl you flunked, uh, you're not exactly sure how you passed through, through geometry when you were in high school. I'm pretty sure the teacher just didn't want to teach you for a third year in, the, in a row. And so he just let you go. And so now you're trying to teach these kids geometry and algebra, and this one's fighting this one, and the dog's doing this thing, and everything's just falling apart. And you're trying, to, you're trying to work from Zoom and all this thing's happening and, and all the pressures of life are pushing in on you and breaking out that old habit that is, that is deeply entrenched in you and that anger and those spurts of anger out against your family. And you could take that image, you go anywhere with, with lust, with greed, with envy, with jealousy, with a complaining spirit. All of those things in us, God wants to work out through us. And he wants to do it in the very same way that he did when he brought us into new life. He wants us to look to him. To, to prepare ourselves for him. To consecrate ourselves for him. To repent of the sin that we've been entertaining and bringing along and walking with and not dealing with. And in, in the line with Joshua, in the line with, with 2 Chronicles 7, 14, in the line with James 4, 8, he's calling us to repent, to humble ourselves before him, to cry out for help, to ask him to come in and work in us the mighty works, a miracle that he's done in the past, the rivers that he's stopped, the lives that he's changed, the new life he's given us, the curse that he's broken in Adam for us. And to continue to do that work in us. I think this is why it says in Philippians 2, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who is at both to work works both in, in you to work and to will his good pleasure. God, God is desiring to do this in us, and he's given us a picture in Joshua of what that looks like in our life. And it starts and it ends with us putting our our focus on beholding who Jesus is and seeing the miraculous works that he's done for us and trusting him as we walk through this life. Now we're going to sing a song. Um, it's, it's my favorite hymn. Uh, you know, some of you are going like, this guy's got a favorite hymn. I don't think I've ever heard him sing a hymn. Well, I've sung some hymns before and I do like hymns. Uh, this one is my favorite. I love it because it's Be Thou My Vision. It's a song describing how a prayer really. God, I need you to be my vision. I need you to be in front of me. I need to see you as you are. I need to gaze into you and allow the riches and the things of this world to fade away from my, my desires. And my desire only be for you. And I think it's a song that we can all carry with us this week. As we seek to walk before the Lord, to, to walk faithfully with him in this life. As he begins to dismantle the strongholds of sin in our life. So I want to invite you to sing that with me. Uh, Jamie and, and Ashley, we're all going to lead it here. 
Um, and this camera's gonna magically pan over to us up there. But my encouragement to you guys is this week, just keep your vision focused on Jesus. Trust him. Love you guys. Can't wait to see you. Uh, hope, uh, hope we can see you soon.